Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your hands up. Then, if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation or after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming the Professor Gazek Oromzbel. Gazek, Professor Oromzbel is a professor of accounting and control at IESA Business School at University of Nevada. Has he received a PhD in business from Stanford University, a PhD in construction engineering from University of Polytechnical de Catalonia. His research focused on executive commissions and corporate governance. His, his work examines the choose and evaluations and uh, corporate governance. His work, his work examines the truth and evaluation the implications of corporate governance mechanism. His uh, current research project analyzes recent trend in managerial competition and uh, corporate uh, governance, financial recognition, uh, bank uh, accounting, and the role of uh, uh, corporate governance in sustainable development. His research published in two ranking journals, including Journal of Accounting and Economics, Journal of Accounting Research, Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, Journal of Law and Economics, Review of Accounting Studies, and the Accounting Review. He is uh, editor uh, of Review of Accounting Studies. Now we will start our seminar with the Professor Rosabel. Thank you very much, Mohammed. I uh, trust that uh, everybody's hearing correctly and uh, everybody can see the, the screen. So thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar series. And uh, I'd like to commend you to, you know, for organizing this, um, this seminar series. I think it's a, it's a great service to the, to the academic community and beyond, perhaps. So um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, trading emission allowances and financial frictions. Okay, so this is joint work with uh, a couple of colleagues, uh, Donald Ngata, uh, he's now at AMD Business School in Ivory Coast, and uh, Rob Rainey, he's a colleague here at the uh, Business School. So let me start with a very quick uh, introduction on um, what is a carbon allowance and, and, and what is the context in which this sort of like new asset arises. A carbon allowance is basically a, a right to emit without a penalty. And uh, it uh, it is created in the context of a uh, cap and trade. So you probably know that there are two ways of putting a price on carbon. One would be a carbon tax, and another one that is becoming increasingly popular is a cap and trade. So in a cap and trade um, uh, scheme, Basically, what the regulator does is um, the regulator defines a, an aggregated uh, amount of, of um, let's say, emissions uh, for, well, the whole economy or specifically for, a, a, you know, the firms that are subject, you know, to, to, the, to the regulation, which are basically uh, firms uh, within certain industries that with a, a higher carbon footprint. And, and then based on this, uh, this uh, aggregated amount, um, uh, the, the regulator, the authority would issue emission allowances. Right? So these emission allowances can be uh, granted for free uh, to companies in certain industries or uh, auctioned. Okay? So uh, usually they are granted for free uh, in industries or in certain, let's say, subsectors where there is a higher risk of carbon leakage. Okay, so carbon leakage meaning, uh, let's say, this notion of bringing your production facilities to a different country that is not subject to the, the, the carbon price. Now, uh, these allowances um, are um, allowed to be traded, and they are traded in uh, what is called an emission trading system. Okay? So basically, the idea is that uh, firms that need more allowances uh, to cover their emissions, and uh, they would buy these allowances from firms that uh, perhaps they have a, a, sh a surplus of, of, of allowances, okay? So they have emissions that are below, let's say the total amount of, of, of allowances that they have. So there would be some trading, uh, and then, uh, you know, based on this, this trading, there is, uh, there is a price, okay? And that price is basically the, 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 carbon, the, the price of carbon. 
Okay, so it, and it's, uh, I guess I don't need to insist that the, the price of carbon is very important, uh, you know, for the decarbonization efforts of the economy. Okay, so I mean, it, it 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 determines basically what are the incentives to 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 decarbonize, right? So uh, this is basically the 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 idea of what a, an emission trading system is. Um, I mean, on top of let's say regulated companies that go to this this market, so to speak, and they you know they they exchange these 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 rights, okay, these emission allowances. Uh, you might also have other market participants. You might have institutions and uh, and you know and other people that provide liquidity. Okay. All right. So uh, the ETS, these um, emission trading systems, uh, are uh, let's say becoming more popular around the world. Okay. So. Um, I guess one of the first movers was was, was Europe. Um, the, the European ETS is uh, the the most well developed in the in the world. Has gone through the different stages. I'm going to talk about it in a in a minute. Uh, but there are other uh, let's say similar schemes that are being created around the world. I mean, notably, I would say China. I mean, this is a a, a recent uh, development. Um, it was created in 2021. Uh, and then you know in North America, I mean you, you have some ETS, um, but not let's say at the federal level in the US, but you know some states uh, have you know some of these uh, these schemes. Okay? And uh, as you can see, I mean there are others under development around the world. So I'm saying this to emphasize that um, what we are finding here, it's, it could be something interesting to know. For all these developments around the world, and I guess that you know our conclusions might be applicable, you know, to places beyond beyond Europe. Okay, um, so we are going to focus here on the European uh, emission trading system. Is uh, like I said, the most uh, well developed uh, in in the world. Uh, now I'm not ready to say that it's the largest one um, because the largest one in terms of volume now. It's probably going to be the Chinese one. Just looking at the at the share volume of the of the economy. In any case, uh, I don't have a specific data on trading volumes on on, on both of them. Uh, but I can certainly say that you know this is the most well developed in the in in the world. I mean, it started in in two thousand five. Okay, it, it already has some history. Um, it is a central pillar uh, of the goal of the European Union to uh, attain climate neutrality by by two thousand fifty. Uh, it covers industries that emit forty percent of the the greenhouse uh, gas emissions in the in the European Union, and it has been developed in four phases. Okay. So here we're going to focus on the third one, uh, which started in two thousand thirteen, and the fourth one started in two thousand twenty one. I mean, why uh, focusing on the third one? Because the first two were a little bit too bumpy. Uh, I mean, it took a while actually to. Um, you know, to 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 get this system to work reasonably well. Um, in the past, there were some big issues. I mean, to the point that uh, I mean, there was a time where the price of carbon was, you know, something very close to zero. So I would say that you know the third phase where was the first one where we could say that things worked reasonably well. Uh, and then we are not covering the fourth phase uh, because we still don't have uh, data uh, readily available. I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but you know these trades are disclosed uh, uh, three years uh, after they take place. Okay? So the disclosure is not uh, timely enough so that we can actually uh, look at that uh, phase. Okay? All right, so what is the uh, research question that we address here? So here's here you you have it on the slide. I mean, do regulated firms sell allowances for financial reasons? Okay, I mean, let, let, let me let me fix the language here. Uh, I don't want to get too much into let's say language issues here, but basically what we mean here is, I guess the natural thing that comes to mind is you know to trade these uh, allowances uh, for compliance reasons. I mean, depending on whether you you need uh, allowances uh, or or you you have excess allowances based on uh, let's say your your emissions or your expected emissions uh, and of course you know it's based on, on price considerations i mean at some point uh, you know it might be uh, you know attractive to do the and to to sell or to buy or not okay 
Uh, but what we uh, want to focus on here is basically other other considerations that might be actually going on here. Okay, so one would be uh, liquidity needs. Okay, so um, you might trade this. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in a minute because you know you you need cash, right? So then you might sell because you need cash. I mean, that, that that is different from, let's say, selling because you think that, you know, you have some excess allowances, you're not gonna need them. Okay. And also you might trade because uh, you might have reported incentives. I mean, to basically to fix your earnings, or, you know, to make your earnings look better. Okay. So um, uh, this is, uh, this these two, let's say, uh, latter considerations are less likely to apply to, to purchases. Uh, they are gonna be, uh, foc uh, mainly focused on on, on sales. Yeah. All right. So, um, Mohammed, you just let me know if if there are questions or comments uh, at any point. Uh, if not, I'm I'm gonna keep going. All right. So, uh, which which is fine. I mean, I can I can give you a flavor of. I mean, what what I'm doing now is basically describing the the institutional setup here. And what are the research questions? So, perhaps questions will come up later. So. Um, Basically, and you know, here um, we think that what we are gonna document is, uh, or we are documenting, it's going on because of uh, certain specific institutional features of uh, this this ETS, these emission trading systems, uh, combined with uh, let's say accounting treatment. That's why this is this is an accounting paper. Okay, it has a very clear accounting angle. Here are the, the key institutional features. Let me go over them uh, you know, with uh, a little bit of time. So the first one is that uh, there's a substantial amount of excess allowances in the, in the system. Okay? This is actually a concern, has been a concern for, for you know, since I would say pretty much since the start of the, uh, of the system. And um, and it's a concern because I mean, of course, you have excess allowances. I mean, you have excess supply, so to speak, in a market that you know, drives prices down, right? That depresses prices, and and we are talking about the price of carbon, and, and the price of carbon is is important for for uh, the, the the green transition. Okay. Um, and also something that we, we want to highlight here is that I mean, excess allowances could be a concern not just uh, because it affects prices, but because there could be other consequences. And the other consequences that we are documenting here is that, uh, well, you know, people could be uh, would be trading uh, based on, let's say, considerations that are not purely related to, I would say, the the the, the initial intent of the of the market, which is basically, you know, trading emissions based on, let's say, you respected uh, emissions uh, based on whether you need them or or not. Uh, for compliance purposes. Now, the second feature that I would highlight here is um, that there's a compliance period of uh, 16 months. Okay, so let me elaborate a little bit on this. So the idea is that I mean the the compliance period um, is uh, basically well, I mean it's one year. It starts in 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 January and and it's in December, but uh, you can surrender your allowances. Uh, in April 30th, okay? So you have four months here uh, to basically, you know, to fix something if, if, if you if you have a problem, okay? So, I mean, if it's uh, January 1st and you, you know, you think that you, you don't have enough allowances, you know, to meet your regulatory requirement, you still have four months to basically get those allowances. And importantly, uh, around February, uh, you receive free allowances. Okay, so, but these free allowances that you receive are supposed to be for the next, uh, uh, let's say, compliance period. Okay, so, but effectively, what you can do is you can use the allowances that you get in February to um, basically meet uh, your your compliance requirement in April. Okay, uh, corresponding to the prior year. Okay? so that gives uh, gives you some sort of like flexibility. Uh, when it comes to selling allowances, because let's say that you know you want to sell allowances in December, for example, because you know, and, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but because you know, selling allowances is going to give you a reporting advantage. 
terms. I mean, it's gonna you're gonna recognize a, a gain in your income in, in your income statement by selling this allowance. Uh, I mean, you might be short of allowances, but you still have some time uh, until April. And importantly, you can uh, use the allowances that you receive in in February to meet your uh, regulatory obligations in in April. Okay. So um, that sort of like gives you some flexibility in terms of, uh, let's say, selling allowances for, uh, let's say, reasons that are not directly related to compliance. Yeah. Now, the third uh, feature that I would highlight here is the accounting treatment. Okay? So uh, there is no standard uh, for the accounting uh, of carbon, uh, emis uh, carbon allowances. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna um, let's say abound a little bit. I'm gonna extend on, on this this idea uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, and then the fourth feature is the disclosure, because so trades are disclosed three years later. So that makes um, let's say disciplining by the market um, particularly difficult. Okay, because the market is gonna learn. Let's say that you know you are selling these allowances for let's say reporting purposes. Um, the market is not going to learn about it until three years down the road, okay? Because these, these trades are not going to be disclosed until three years later. So this, uh, I mean, these institutional features taken together generate what I would describe as some sort of like arbitrage opportunity, okay? Uh, what I mean by this is that, I mean, they sort of like generate uh, for you the, the possibility of uh, selling these allowances uh, for purposes that are not necessarily related to compliance, you know, to get a liquidity or, or a reporting advantage. And they give you the flexibility to, let's say, uh, you know, to, to still meet your regu regulatory requirements, okay? Even though, you know, you might be doing this uh, for things that are not necessarily related to uh, the regulation itself. Now, um, I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit more about the accounting for uh, carbon emission allowances. Uh, um, I would say from an accounting perspective, this is particularly interesting uh, because I mean, what is economically, what is an emission allowance? I mean, a, it gives you the right to produce emissions without incurring penalties, right? So I guess the first question is uh, what type of asset? Is this right? So, uh, is it a, a financial asset? I mean, is it an intangible asset? Um, is it inventory? Uh, which measurement approach best reflects the uh, economic uh, effects of emission allowances? Okay, so shall we account for this using fair value or historical cost? Uh, many allowances are government grants, you know, which sort of like, you know raises the question of whether we should realize uh, you know this 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 grant as a as a day one gain uh, whether we should treat it as a as, as deferred income or, or simply record it at uh, cost which uh, which is zero right um, I mean you are getting these allowances for free okay now I mean this currently no standard on how to account for uh, for carbon allowances, uh, for emission allowances. And um, this there's some prior research that shows that the accounting treatment matters. Okay, so I would encourage you, if you are interested in this topic, you know, to take a look at uh, a paper recently published uh, in Management Science by John Chad, Jennifer, Catherine. So this in, in this paper, you know, basically they they uh, simulate uh, uh, different accounting treatments, and they show that it affects uh, earnings in a in a significant way. And, and they actually end up uh, recommending an accounting treatment based on fair value. Okay. I mean, uh, of of course, this is this doesn't do justice, you know, to the complexity of the paper, and it's an oversimplification. But just you know, in a nutshell, I think that at least that's what I got from the paper. So. Most firms, the fact is that most firms uh, account for granted allowances at historical cost, which is zero. Okay? Because there is no standard, um, I guess in most jurisdictions, well, I, mean, I guess in all jurisdictions, there is a, there is a, um, you know, you know, some, sort of, some sort of flexibility to account for this in, in the way that uh, firms decide. Right? And um, 
uh, of course, there's, there's no, uh, let's say, systematic data on this, um, but uh, there's, there are some surveys. And uh, what these surveys suggest is that most of the firms account for these allowances at historical cost. Okay? And, and in, I mean, you get these allowances for free. I mean, if, if these, these allowances are granted by the government because you are in a sector that is deemed to have, let's say, a high um, probability of carbon leakage, uh, the historical cost is zero. Okay. Now, when they sell the allowance, uh, they're going to recognize a gain. Okay. And, and I'm going to illustrate this in, in one second. Okay. And the um, increasing effect on earnings occurs when the firm has excess allowances. Let me uh, illustrate these two latter points. Okay. So, uh, sorry, because I, I am talking to accounting professors and that me a little bit too basic. Okay. But uh, just to simplify. Okay. So, here. Here is uh, one situation where uh, of selling excess uh, of selling allowances when they, uh, when you have excess allowances, okay. So that means that you know you have more allowances than your expected emissions. I mean, in this case, uh, basically, you know, you take this asset that is off your books, okay. So, I mean, it's basically, you know, um, valued at, at zero uh, historical cost, which is zero. Let's say that you, you uh, and this is this is a grant from the government, uh, so you you realize again. Okay. So, I mean, you get your cash. I mean, let's say that you sell it for 1 million, which is basically the average size of, of the sale uh, that we are finding in the data. Uh, and you would realize a, a gain of 1 million in your income statement, right? Now, uh, here's the situation where you do not have excess allowances. Okay, So let's say that your expected emissions are supposed to be uh, greater than the, uh, the, the granted allowances. I mean, in that case, uh, I mean, you sell uh, this asset, you're going to have to recognize a liability uh, because you have an economic obligation. Okay? So, um, you know, it sort of like suggests, well, I mean, it is the case that you're going to have to buy these allowances in the future to meet your regulatory requirement. So then, you know, your accountant, uh, you know, following, uh, let's say, the usual accounting principles uh, would make you, you know, recognize some sort of liability. Okay, so basically what this is telling you is that um, you're gonna have, if you look at this slide and the previous slide, is that you have a reporting advantage when you have uh, excess allowances. And this uh, um, this reporting advantage doesn't exist if you don't have these excess allowances, okay? This is gonna be important uh, for us in terms of identification because we're gonna be uh, you know, running tests, uh, you know, taking this, this sort of variation into account, and uh, and effectively, one uh, like I'm I'm, I'm going to show in a minute that we find our results uh, in cases where uh, the firm has excess allowances. Okay. Now, uh, based on this, uh, I'm going to start talking about the empirics here. Okay, so uh, we are going to cover uh, basically the years uh, within the third phase of uh, the European ETS. So that means from 2013 to uh, 2017. Okay. And um, what we have is basically a, a cross section that I would say is a, is a decent cross section. I mean, over 2000 firms per year. Um, not all these firms are going to be um, publicly listed. Okay. So uh, actually most of our firms are private firms, but uh, these are relatively large firms, okay? So um, we are uh, talking about, uh, let's say, sectors of the economy uh, that, let's say, have relatively high barriers of entry. Uh, so, I mean, what we are talking about here is, 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 is not small or SMEs, you know, sort of like, a, you know, a really a small undertakings. Right. So um, we have in total uh, over 3,000 unique firms from 29 countries and 10 industries. Okay. Let me exceed, uh, you know, let me elaborate a little bit on, on, on this. I mean, these are the industries that we have in the data. These are the industries basically that are uh, subject to the, uh, the ETS. Okay. So the ETS was introduced by a, a European directive. And uh, this is what the, the industries that are defined in the directive you know, to be subject to, uh, to the cap and trade system uh, in the European Union. So, um, like I said, I mean, you have their uh, sectors that, um, of the economy that require relatively high barriers of entry. 
Um, so the, the firms that we're going to have in the sample are not necessarily small firms. Okay. All right, so these are the 29 countries uh, from which we collect the, uh, the data. Um, here you can see, uh, let's say, um, countries in the in the union, but also some countries that voluntarily uh, take part in the in the EU. Even though I mean they are sort of like a within the European, let's say, geographical region, but they are not necessarily in the euro, and um, you know, and and they are uh, not necessarily in the in the in the union, but they you know they voluntarily decided to join the the European ETS system. Now, uh, these are the uh, descriptive statistics, okay? For what we have, we have a total of um, close to 12,000 observations. Um, and these are basically the, the descriptive statistics of our uh, key variables. I mean, I'm gonna talk about these variables uh, as I describe the, the empirical tests. Now, I mean, before I get into, uh, let's say the results, um, Let's talk a little bit about the hypothesis here. I mean, I have sort of like already talked about this, but just to maybe you know to insist a little bit and just make sure that you know this is the hypotheses are clear. I mean, uh, selling allowances for liquidity reasons. Okay, so I mean we will be talking about firms with higher short-term cash obligations and or lower short-term uh, cash flow resources. Okay, that basically sell allowances, you know, to get some additional cash to meet uh, liquidity needs. Okay. Um, selling allowances would avoid incurring additional financing costs. I mean, let's say that you know you have some short-term debt, and then you know you don't have enough liquidity to to you know to honor this uh, this commitment. So then you know you would get some some additional cash by selling these these allowances, and 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 in that in that way you would you would avoid let's say maybe you know getting some sort of like penalty from your bank or whatever you know lend you this money. Um, it can be done with limited transparency. Let me emphasize here that these trades are, uh, let's say, disclosed three years down the road. And this is um, likely going to be more pronounced for firms facing greater uh, financial constraints, okay, because of the reason that I just outlined, right? And there is anecdotal evidence supporting that firms do this, okay? So um, we, we, we found uh, some anecdotal evidence in, let's say, survey, uh, I mean, and, and also talking with practitioners, you know, talking with people in this sort of like sectors. Um, I mean, you sort of like get the sense that this is actually believable, okay? So that this is going on. It's not something illegal or anything like that. Let me emphasize this, okay? And now uh, selling allowances to boost your earnings, okay? So reporting poor financial performance, uh, we know from prior literature that can, uh, let's say, generate some problems, right? Uh, I mean, for example, uh, you have some bullet points there. I mean, like, you know, it might trigger viability concerns and increase the potential of shareholders of exercising the abandonment option. Okay, so this, this has been, let's say, uh, explained by prior literature. I mean, it might impact executive bonus payments. Okay, uh, right. So, again, you know, executives are getting their bonuses because they don't reach whatever, you know, performance threshold uh, based on, let's say, accounting information that they have in their bonus scheme. Uh, it might impact the covenants, okay, because some of these covenants are based on, let's say, um, accounting performance, okay, um, and this effect might be stronger for, for for private firms, particularly in in Europe where extensive creditor rights elevate the, the threat of creditor intervention. Okay, I mean we are not, uh, let's say, too strong on whether it's a private or a public firm sort of like effect. Um, um, but uh, um, this, is, this certainly can happen in, in private firms, not just you know public firms that are subject to to public scrutiny. Okay. Now I'm going to start. Let's say uh, describing the tests. Uh, the first test that we have here is uh, basically is an association um, between uh, the dependent variable, which is whether you are a net seller or not. Okay, so. Yeah, whether you are a net seller means that you know you you sell more allowances than what you buy, okay? And uh, just to avoid, uh, let's say, cases that are very close to, let's say, the margin or very close to zero, uh, we would basically um, code as zero 
uh, net sellers where let's say the, the, the what you would sell is is basically a very very small amount of your uh, total assets okay less than uh, 0 0.01 percent of total assets okay basically with this we would exclude let's say net selling activity that is very very marginal okay so basically what we're gonna pick up with this variable is net selling activity that is yeah, substantial okay and then on the on the right hand side what you have is um a dummy variable that mm, basically uh takes the value of one if uh, you would report losses without the selling proceeds okay so let's say that you know you take your income statement just to make sure that this is clear to everybody you you would take your income a statement you would subtract the proceeds from your 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 sales of, of these allowances right and if that is a loss uh, we would call it as, as one okay and, and then whether you have a liquidity need uh, and we call whether you have a liquidity need with a dummy variable is an indicator variable that takes the value of one if the if your quick ratio is less than one okay so in other words, if your cash or cash equivalents are uh, lower than your, uh, let's say, current liabilities, okay, at the measure at the beginning of the year. So what you have there is a very strong positive association between, uh, let's say, these two uh, independent variables that are meant to capture, you know, whether you have a, a, a reporting incentive, you know, to sell uh, these allowances because by selling these allowances, you're going to go from losses to to non-losses, you know, to profits uh, in your PNL, uh, you're going to avoid losses in other ways, in, uh, you know, saying this uh, differently, right? And uh, whether, you know, you have a liquidity need, so you might be actually selling allowances uh, because you have this liquidity need, right? And, and these are basically the, the two motivations that are outlined before in the prior, in the prior slide. Now, I mean, we find that this association uh, is a stronger, uh, basically exists when you have um, excess allowances, okay? Um, let me remind you, I mean, excess allowances is that you have more allowances than, uh, let's say, your expected emissions, okay? So basically, you know, we take the emissions here, right, in the, in the following uh, period, which is a proxy for your expected emissions and see whether they are, actually you know bigger or 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 or, or smaller than uh let's say your um, your stock of allowances at the beginning of the period okay so let me remind you that you know like some slides ago and basically uh you know the the, the point was I mean, what i explained is that you know you have um a reporting advantage here if you have uh, excess uh, allowances okay if you don't have excess allowances, you're going to have to recognize a liability that is uh, going to have an impact on your on your income statement, and then this reporting advantage uh, vanishes. Okay, and then on on the liquidity side, I mean, it's also going to be likely that you know you are more likely to do this, uh, you know, to sell these these allowances if you have excess allowances, because if you don't have excess allowances, it is more likely that uh, you're going to have to go back to the market and and. And, and, and sell these allowances, perhaps at a time where, let's say, the prices are, uh, let's say, more expensive. Okay. All right. So then here, I mean, um, another, let's say, point I made uh, on my presentation of the accounting of this is that this is probably going to be more likely when you have free allowances. Okay. So when you get these allowances, uh, for free from the government because you are in an industry with a relatively high risk of um, uh, carbon leakage. Uh, and then, you know, because you get it for free, I mean, your books, it, it would be accounted for at zero, uh, at zero, okay? So at nil, uh, they say. Um, and then at, uh, when you sell it, so basically, you know, you, 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 you you account for this, uh, let's say, at, 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 at the market value, and then you recognize uh, uh, again, right? And this is exactly what we find in the in the data. I mean, we find that the association between pre-selling loss, okay, so basically whether you you would report a loss without the proceeds of this uh, of of this uh, sale, right? Uh, and uh, let's say whether you are a net seller, right? So this association is stronger. 
uh, when uh, you know you have relatively a higher percentage of these free allowances, or basically as you, as you see in the two last columns, when you have basically when you have free allowances, I mean when you do not have free allowances, the results seem to uh, let's say uh, not be there. Okay. Um, now, financial constraints, right? I mean, when I talked about liquidity, basically the argument I made is that, well, you know, this is going to be an issue if you have financial uh, constraints, right? Because if you don't have financial constraints, maybe, you know, you just go to the bank and then you, you get more money, right? Um, so this is what we find in the data, that the association between uh, having a liquidity need and, 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 and being a net seller uh, is a stronger, it's actually there when you have financial constraints, okay? For financial constraints, we use a, let's say, a standard measure from the from the finance literature. And here you have, let's say, the continuous measure uh, and then a dummy variable on whether you are in the in the higher quartile based on the on, on your financial constraints, okay? Now, um, here, I mean, just to, let's say, tighten identification here, we, we do an analysis around, uh, reporting threshold and a very important reporting threshold uh, in the literature is zero, okay? So, you know, we have in the literature uh, plenty of evidence that firms tend to avoid losses, okay? So they tend to avoid, let's say, reporting a, a profit or well, an income statement number that is below zero, okay? So uh, here, what we do is uh, on the left hand, on the right hand side, I'm sorry, so we create a dummy variable that takes the value of one if your earnings are um, just above uh, uh, zero, okay? Uh, so, um, and we find that, uh, let's say, I mean, if you are, uh, let's say in this area of, um, let's say that reported and the, and the space of reporting earnings, uh, it is more likely that you are a net seller, okay? And as you can see, uh, the result becomes, or the association becomes weaker once you take, let's say a wider range over zero, okay? So we seem to be finding a strong results when you report very, very small earnings, okay? Which are, and these are firms that are, let's say, more suspicious of basically having done something, you know, to go from uh, the minus sort of space, you know, to the positive space, okay? So from going from reporting losses to reporting uh, profits, okay? And uh, uh, I mean, if we run a placebo where we take, uh, let's say, the the one to um, uh, interval there, okay. So once we we move beyond the, the zero threshold, uh, again the the result disappears, and there the, the doesn't seem to be, let's say, a strong association there, right? So and you know we find this for cases where you know you you have excess allowances uh, we do not find any result uh, if you do not have excess allowances because if again if you don't have these excess allowances there is no reporting gain it's okay there is no reporting advantage okay. now uh, we also look at just to you know to further tie identification here uh, we look at the distribution of sales over the year and uh, we find uh, I would say uh, uh, an abnormal amount of sales in December. And we know that, well, most of our, our, our sample firms um, have actually, we, we restrict the analysis uh, you know, to firms that have a December year end. Okay? Um, and, uh, and we know that because it's also documented in the literature that uh, in the last month of the reporting period is more action, so to speak in quotes, you know, to fix your earnings, right? So that's where we find, let's say, an abnormal amount of selling. Okay, so which is consistent with the notion that uh, these firms are selling uh, these assets to get a boost in their earnings uh, at the end of the of the reporting period. Uh, we do not find such pattern uh, for firms that uh, do not have uh, a December fiscal year end. Okay, look at this this graph on your right and and compare it to the 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 graph on your on your left. I think that the the um the the patterns are uh, show a, a striking contrast okay now we also uh just to, to get at you know whether this actually happens at the end of the year what we do here is basically you know we measure the percentage of sales that happen in the last quarter or the percentage of sales during the year that happen uh, in december okay sales of allowances that's what i mean 
And uh, we find again that, you know, there's a positive association between, you know, you're selling at the end of the period, either in the last quarter or in December, and, you know, you having, uh, let's say, reporting incentives to sell these allowances, okay? Because otherwise you would uh, report a loss, okay? And again, you know, this is a stronger or it's there. I mean, if you have excess allowances, okay? If you don't have excess, excess allowances, uh, the result is, let's say, very weak or, or it's just not there, okay? And we don't find a similar pattern with uh, purchases, okay? So, I mean, if we did something similar, okay, a parallel, a parallel analysis with, with purchases rather than, than sales, uh, we just don't find this association. All right, so another thing that we do here just to get an identification is uh, um, we exploit variation in the price of these allowances. Okay, so I mean, over uh, this this uh, third phase of the um, of the European ETS, we have some variation in the price of uh, of carbon, okay, in the, in the price of these allowances. So we also exploit this and we see whether uh, this is actually more likely to happen when prices are uh, higher, right? Because if prices are higher, you know, you have... A, you, you're going to get some money out of these sales. I mean, prices are relatively low. I mean, this is uh, the, the let's say the sale the sales proceeds are going to be of course lower, right? Uh, and this is what we find. I mean, we we seem to be finding for uh, once again for the subset of firms that have excess allowances, we seem to be finding. We do this analysis at the monthly level. Okay, uh, we have some more granularity here. We look at uh, sales at the selling activity at the monthly level. So we find that uh, it is more likely that you know you say you sell in uh, in that month if prices are higher and if otherwise you would report a, a loss. Okay, so that means that I mean if prices are uh, very low, uh, basically you know by selling uh, this allowance that you you would not have enough cash you know to to assuage your 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 liquidity needs uh, and you would not have enough let's say reporting advantage, so to speak. I mean, like the, the, the accounting gain uh, that you would report would not be, perhaps not be, uh, let's say, uh, large enough, you know, to, to fix your earnings and, you know, to go from, let's say, the negative space to a positive space in the in the earnings, uh, in the reporting earnings, okay? All right, so um, we also find that uh, this, this result, I mean, this association is stronger uh, when you recently took on uh, debt, okay? So you know, when you have, uh, let's say, a positive uh, change in in the in, in 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 reporting debt, that means that you know you went to your bank and you you got some additional money, right? So that means that you know you have a stronger, let's say, potentially you have a stronger obligations uh, or tighter obligations with your with your bank, okay? At least you have more debt. Or at least you have more obligations, okay? And also, we we find that the result is stronger uh, when uh, you know you, your sales growth is lower. Uh, we find uh, we 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 know from prior literature that uh, firms that uh, have let's say higher sales growth they get a, a break from their bank. Okay, so they they get a more benign treatment uh, from their uh, their banks. So again, you know we we are. We're getting this result for firms that are probably going to be uh, uh, more likely you know, to get in trouble with, with uh, their banks. Okay. Um, now, I mean, let me show you, uh, and uh, I would finish with this uh, last, let's say, battery of tests. What I'm going to show here is, I mean, I, I hope that um, you, know, you, you will agree with me that you know, all this, this evidence that I just showed is pretty suggestive of the fact that uh, well, you know, firms might be selling allowances for reporting reasons or for liquidity reasons. Um, now, I guess that the the next question is, uh, so what? Okay, so I mean, is this um, let's say having an effect some somehow on the on the ETS market? I mean, uh, is this let's say big enough or substantial enough for us you know, to, to care about it, right? Okay, so I mean, th this is a big question, right? And I personally think that um, it's not strictly necessary for, for the paper to be interesting, but, you know, we have been pushed, you know, to go in this direction and you know, we, we, we agree that this, I mean, it's, it's important to at least, you know, do our best 
you know, to try to figure out whether this is actually affecting the functioning of the of the market in any way. Okay? By saying this, I mean, uh, let me say this up front. I mean, we're going to be very cautious when it comes to, uh, let's say, um, you know, drawing, uh, let's say, implications or drawing conclusions in terms of, let's say, welfare. Okay. Um, we don't have ev enough evidence in the paper, and, and I'm not sure whether you know it is possible to get this evidence, uh, but uh, certainly there's, there's only so much we can do in the paper in that regard. Um, I mean, of course, we, we're not going to have direct evidence on whether this is welfare increasing or not. We can have a conversation about this uh, in the in the Q and A um, part of the of the seminar if you want, right? Uh, but at least what we wanted to show here is that this is this is not inconsequential. Okay, I'm gonna show you some tests here. I mean, of course, you know you could interpret this evidence in different ways, um, but I think that at least uh, what this evidence that I'm gonna show now suggests is that um, this is not inconsequential. Okay, so this is something worth knowing, so to speak, something worth uh, keeping in mind. Uh, especially when it comes to, let's say, designing uh, or, you know, rethinking the design of the institutional design of, of, of this market, which is a new market, is a market that has gone over, let's say, several, let's say, changes in the institutional design. And I'm not sure it's perfect yet, right? So, so I think that, you know, the documenting this can actually get us also, you know, to think or let's say keep keep alive the debate on, how should we, uh, let's say, design this 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 market? Okay, but again, I mean, I am ready to, you know, to hear from you different interpretations of the of the evidence. I'm, I'm just going to show. Okay, I'm going to show you the evidence. The evidence is the following. I mean, the first, we document uh, in terms of let's say the potential impact of this on the functioning of the market, right? So, we first uh, show that um, I mean, if you are a net seller, it is more likely that you end up not being compliant with the regulation. Uh, it is more likely that you know you end up borrowing from the future. What do we mean by borrowing from the future? That means borrowing allowances from the future. That means, uh, I mean, you go back to my prior explanation on the, let's say the compliance period. Remember that I highlighted that, uh, you know, you get uh, allowances from the government in February, sometime in February. So you can use these allowances that you get for the next period to uh, meet your uh, compliance obligations uh, with respect to the prior period, okay? That's what we mean by borrowing from the future, basically mm -hmm. using allowances to meet your, your current obligations that are meant to be uh, used to, uh, let's say, to, 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 to meet your future obligations, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so we 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 also find that you know, the probability of being a net seller is associated with you borrowing these allowances from the future. Okay, so using these allowances that you get now for the future period, you know, to comply with with your obligations in this period, and then uh, it it is also positively associated with uh, and the probability that you are an abnormal surrender. So what does it mean to be an abnormal surrender? It means that. Uh, there is some sort of issue in the in the compliance uh, process. Okay, so you know we observe uh, this, the additional surrendering after April. Uh, it could be that um, you you know you you mm, you know you 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 submitted some some allowances. You submit a report, and the regulators um, raise some issues about this report. Mm -hmm. Uh, or maybe you know you need not um, let's say submit your 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 allowances on time, and they gave you a little bit more 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 time, and you ended up in surrender the uh, or submitting it, uh, let's say not in April, but uh, a little bit later on, uh, or maybe you know you you surrender uh, you, you you submitted part of your obligations, but not all of them, and you sort of like complement this a little bit later on. Okay, in any case, I would uh, describe this as a. At least this is a deviation from a standard compliance behavior. Okay. I mean, it's something that, I mean, in theory, should not happen. Okay. And, and then we also look at whether, um, let's say, the selling activity that is associated with liquidity and reporting is large enough to tilt 
the trading balance of the market, of the ETS market towards selling, okay? I mean, in other words, whether, you know, this selling activity that comes from liquidity and reporting is putting an additional selling pressure on the market, okay? This is important because this additional selling pressure might have an effect on prices. And we're gonna test that in a second, okay? But for the moment, what I'm showing you uh, in this in this slide is basically that you know if if there is a higher percentage of sales that are let's say related to liquidity or reporting right or uh, or, or both this is what we call sales financial right uh, I mean either uh, related to liquidity or reporting I mean uh, some, somewhat related to this what we, we we call in the paper financial financial frictions right. So it's an, a, a positive association with, let's say, the selling intensity, okay? So the percentage of sales with respect to total trade. So that means that, I mean, there are reasons to believe that, you know, these this, this liquidity trades or these reporting trades, so to speak, are putting additional uh, selling pressure on the, on the market. And this could have, let's say, effect on prices. And this is what we seem to be finding uh, in, in the next test. Uh, basically, what we look at here is, uh, let's say changing changes in, in in carbon prices. Okay, so we we compute the return on the on, on the spot price of of carbon these carbon allowances um, on a daily basis, right? Uh, and we find that this is negatively associated with uh, let's say selling intensity. Okay, which is you know consistent with this idea that you know this additional selling intensity is putting downward pressure on carbon prices. And this is more likely to happen if there's a higher percentage of uh, uh, sales that are, let's say, related to either liquidity or uh, reporting uh, uh, reporting incentives, okay? We also uh, find results uh, when we um, look at the difference between the, the spot price at the end of the day and the auction price at the beginning of the day, okay? So uh, this is basically within day variation, just in case you had a concern on whatever, you know, looking at uh, returns based on the prior day, okay? Um, and then we find that actually this is something that is unique to the, 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 the trade day, okay? So, I mean, this, this effect sort of like uh, fades away or, you know, disappears once you uh, actually um, look at days that are beyond the, the trading day, okay? Or before the trading day. Okay. So, you know, this sort of like suggests that this indeed this is um, this is associated with the trading, okay? Uh, because we know that these carbon prices also depend on many other things, right? I mean, then like, let's say, economic and macroeconomic factors and so on and so forth. Okay. And now, and I'm, um, I'm about to finish my presentation, uh, but, and these are, let's say, new tests that we are working on. Um, so in a way, this is a premiere. Um, you know, we, we kept working on this and we found that mm, there is uh, some cross-sectional, uh, I would say cross-country variation uh, in, uh, let's say, the accounting treatment of this, okay? Uh, even though there's, uh, there's, uh, there's no standard, uh, but there's some guidance. We found uh, based on a survey that is uh, basically, is a, this is a, a survey uh, on the implementation of the of the directive that introduced the the ETS in Europe, okay? and so they run this this daily uh, this uh, this annual survey, where among other things they ask the countries uh, whether they have some sort of like accounting guidance for uh, these these allowances, and we found interestingly we found some variation there. We found that uh, the guidance in some countries is basically you know they they would encourage fair value. Um, by fair value, I mean, you know, uh, let's say valuing these, these allowances at fair value, okay? So at uh, market value, and uh, when when they got these, these allowances, either for free or whether they they purchase them. Um, and uh, uh, in other countries, uh, I mean, they, uh, they sort of like encourage this, you know, to, to firms, you know, to value this at cost, okay? In other countries, it's sort of like unclear, okay? Again, you know, this is, it's not that this is mandatory, but it's a guidance. So, I mean, this could be used by um, auditors, okay? I mean, you know, to push some firms, you know, to, to do the accounting in one way or the other. So interestingly, what we find here is that um, the association uh, between basically, you know, your re reporting incentive and whether you're a net seller 
is concentrated in countries uh, where the guidance sort of like encourages you know to 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 measure this at at, at historical value. Okay. Uh, and then you know the liquidity need, right? So you know it seems to be uh, let's say more common in firms where you know this is actually um, encouraging you know, to do to be done at at, at fair value. Okay, so you know it seems to be some sort of like cross sectional variation here that is consistent with the notion that uh, indeed accounting uh, plays an important role here. Okay, and I'm almost done, uh, but I want to show you. Um, just two more slides, okay? Uh, which again, you know, they relate to new tests that we are working on now. Um, we also look at whether, you know, on top of let's say affecting the the, the functioning of the ETS system, this could also affect uh, let's say firms' incentives to decarbonize. Okay, and here what we find is that there is a positive association between. Let's say that the, the percentage of these sales that are, let's say, financially motivated, either reporting or uh, liquidity, um, and then and, and, and whether you increase emissions. Okay, so you know this would suggest that perhaps you are less careful about uh, you know your emissions uh, if uh, you know you tend to do this. Okay, or you know put it differently. I mean, the 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 fact that you know you have this flexibility. You know, to 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 sell these these allowances for reasons that are let's say not related to compliance might actually you know weaken your incentives to decarbonize okay and uh, we find that this association is weaker uh, in countries that has uh, had a, a have a, a, a guidance uh, on fair value okay so those firms that would encourage firms to to do this to 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 account for these allowances at fair value okay so. Um, in other words, I mean, it, it is consistent with the table I just showed, right? Uh, that this you know, is more likely to happen for reporting reasons in uh, countries uh, where, uh, let's say, accounting for these allowances at a historical cost is more prevalent. Okay. And uh, what we find also is that, I mean, this, this seems to be no association with, um, let's say, future um, financial performance either based on earnings or cash flows. There seems to be no obvious association with cost of debt. So, um, uh, I mean, in a way, this sort of uh, suggests that um, you might not be doing this um, at the cost of uh, shareholder value, okay? I mean, all this game that I just described empirically um, could actually be done uh, in the best interest of shareholders. That's fine. Okay, um, it might be the case that uh, who's going to be worse off here? I mean, in terms of let's say the welfare potential welfare implications here, who's going to be worse off is going to be the society at large. Maybe you know the the, the nature, <laughs> you know, because it, it it affects the carbonization. It, it affects let's say incentives, you know, to to transition towards a a, a greener economy. But it, at least it's not it's not obvious that you know shareholders are going to be worse off, right? And it's also, let's say, not obvious that banks are, uh, let's say, seen through it or, uh, or shareholders are seen through this, right? Because, again, you know, these this, this trades are not uh, terribly transparent, right? So with this, um, I think that, I mean, there, I have some robustness analysis, but uh, I'm going to skip those uh, for the sake of having some time for the, for the debate here. Uh, let me summarize the presentation, the takeaway from the paper. In my mind, is that firms sell allowances responding to liquidity needs and reporting incentives. Uh, let me emphasize that the welfare implications are not necessarily direct or clear. Okay? I think that there are reasons to believe that this is impacting the functioning of the of the ETS. Um, it might also reduce financial statement comparability. Um, it could also have negative consequences for shareholders that we are not able to capture in these tests that I just showed, right? In any case, I don't think that these negative consequences are, um, let's say, immediately obvious. And I mean, if you believe uh, that this is not good, and uh, um, here's the the good news. I, I mean, conditional on you believing that this is not uh, this is this is not a desirable thing. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you are on that side, um, I mean, it might be interesting for you to know that this could be avoided. Okay. 
This could be avoided by reducing the excess allowances, which is happening. Actually, the, the, the European Commission has done a, a number of things you know, to reduce the amount of excess allowances in this, in this market, right? Uh, we could also reconsider the timing of the, of the compliance cycle. Okay? We could regulate the accounting um, for these carbon allowances. Okay? So, I mean, if firms, um, let's say, were forced you know, to account for these allowances at fair value, I mean, this, this potential reporting game or this potential reporting advantage would simply not exist. Okay? Or maybe uh, with more frequent disclosure of ETS trades that would basically allow market participants or capital providers, let's say banks or or uh, let's say equity investors, you know, to be aware that this is going on, right? You know, uh, conditional on them actually caring about it, because like I said, it means not, let's say, immediately obvious that, uh, you know, they, they are going to be the ones internalizing the potential, let's say, societal cost derived from uh, what we are documenting, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so I will leave it here, uh, Mohamed. I mean, uh, I'm uh, more than open to, you know, to you know, try to address any questions that the audience might have. I think I talked for a whole hour, uh, so so I think that that should be enough. I guess, right? And sorry if it was uh, a little bit too long. Yeah, thank you very much, dear Professor Ronald as well, for your contribution and for ever. It's really an excellent presentation and excellent paper. Thank you very much. Now, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Hi. Hi, Prof. Uh, Orhan Mazaba. Orhan Mazaba. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, I think your presentation is super interesting because you use a lot of graphs and a lot of some statistics results are very convincing. I learned a lot from your presentation. So my question is more about, uh, so of course we know like this question, your research question is very important practically, practically. But so uh, regarding to the theoretical contribution, because I also noticed that uh, in 2015, there's a JBF paper published by uh, Prof. Ois Chich and uh, uh, Tasiakas, Tasiakas. So they also find that uh, firms receive free uh, carbon emission allowance significantly outperform those who do not in the stock market. And this, uh, uh, this results can be explained by the cash flow effect of the carbon allowances. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure are you aware of that uh, paper, but I guess... Um, I, I was not aware uh, of this paper. I mean, if you could send me the reference... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, sure. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but of course, your paper is super different from them. Uh, I think because you have a more accounting angle, and uh, that's extremely interesting to me as a accounting PhD student at at Singapore. So, yeah, that's my uh, question and suggestion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, mm, no. That thanks for the for the question. I mean, it's um, <laughs> it is. I think it is important to. Um, basically learn about, I mean, you know, I guess with research, we're gonna hit the whole picture of this, right? I mean, what we are showing is basically a small part of the picture. Uh, we are just showing, let's say one potential effect of, um, you know, this, this institutional features that I was talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. um, an effect that has, I would say at least, I would say unclear welfare implications, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. We, we might have different opinions about whether this is good or bad or whether we should be tougher on, let's say, avoiding this or not, right? But I think that uh, we all agree that uh, at least, you know, the welfare implications are not clearly positive, okay, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this could not be, let's say, uh, let's say the first order effect of, of these institutional features or, I mean, it, it might not be, the, let's say, the most important, let's say, economic consequence, okay? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can see, for example, let's say, a direct effect of, let's say, these excess allowances on prices, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and the effect on pricing of the, having these excess allowances is going to be, uh, let's say, way more important than what we are documenting here. Even though what we are documenting here is that Basically, uh, you can interpret this as let's say part of the of the potential effect of these excess allowances on on carbon pricing 
I said, you know, one channel could 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 be, let's say, reporting on liquidity, you know, these these financial frictions, which I think is is important to to know. I mean, is this the most important challenge uh, channel? Um, I don't know, probably not, right? But it seems to be something uh, something substantial that we wanna we wanna know, right? And mm -hmm. and you know, um, and without getting too much into into the welfare implications here, you know, to the extent that this could be uh, this whole game that we are documenting could be easily avoidable by just by changing not all of them uh, of these uh, say institutional features that I outlined, but only just a few of them or maybe one of them. Okay. Um, I think that, and, and, you know, basically changing this doesn't seem to be, to have, let's say, obvious negative welfare consequences. You would say, well, maybe this is worth considering. There was a debate uh, in the IFRS Foundation uh, some years ago, precisely about, in 2000, around 2017, precisely uh, around uh, the accounting for uh, carbon emissions. And uh, so there was a debate on whether they should issue a, a standard, right? So mm -hmm. there was a project, okay, for that. And the project got stalled, right? And uh, it never went anywhere. Uh, but, you know, perhaps this paper is sort of like suggesting that we should actually rekindle this debate, right? And uh, maybe, you know, start thinking again, thinking about whether we need, you know, a standard for, for, the, for uh, the, the accounting for this asset, right? So we're taking this project. Okay. That yeah. said, you know, perhaps what this other paper that you mentioned is is um, is documenting is perhaps it's a it's it's a different effect, and it is possible that it's a is a it's it's a more important effect than let's say in terms of welfare consequences than than the one that we are mm -hmm. documenting. I'm I'm not I'm not disputing that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, as well. Yeah, questionnaire. Yes, you can ask. Hi, uh, I believe that uh, that's me. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, the name is Masood, and I'm from uh, West Yorkshire, Huddersfield, UK, uh, from the business school. Uh, I've got a few points. I think I put a point in the chat earlier on because when when you were talking about historical cost being zero, I was a little bit uh, unsure about what the cost is for those that buy allowances. Um, so those companies that get the, the grants, they get the freebies, if you like, from governments, obviously the, the historical cost for them is zero. Yes. But, but as, the, as these allowances are traded um, <clears throat> the, in the auction, uh, on the auction platforms, so surely uh, you'd expect many of these companies, they are both, you know, maybe, in possession of free allowances, also uh, paid for allowances. Yeah. So it can't be historical cost equal zero in all in all cases. I that's one. Right. That's one point. I have others. I have other points if, if time allows and if uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to address this one. Uh, yeah, my short answer is, and I'm, I'm seeing this in the, in the chat too. Uh, the, my short answer is uh, yes, you're right. I mean, uh, I mean, you get you purchase an allowance uh, from some other company or from, let's say, um, or, or from an auction, right? Uh, the historical cost is not zero. Okay, um, so totally. Okay, the like historical cost would be zero strictly in cases where you get them for free from the government. Does this... Yeah, that that was just for like I just wanted that clarified because in terms of the how the accounting treatment should be, yeah. um, I believe in most cases the firms will be both in two positions if you like at the same time being in possession of of free allowances also in possession of allowances that they have paid for and for the, the accounting treatment, uh, whatever shape it takes, it needs to maybe differentiate between them. That's right. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is true. And, you know, there's only, only so much we can do, um, you know, in, in that regard, in the sense that, I mean, we, we don't have granular data on, on the stocks that firms have on, this, on these allowances, okay? I mean... Uh, um, and you know the reporting of this is is pretty limited, and and you know it's it's actually aggregated with other 
you know other financial assets and other other types of assets right so there's only so much we can do but uh i think we we do find um you know some variation based on I'd say we, we do have some data on 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 the allowances that they get from free on the market because I think that this is uh, this is publicly observable, and also we have variation based on the industries where they are and and there's uh, there's a, a very specific definition on uh, say industries that get these allowances for free and, and industries that don't. Okay, so I mean um, I wish we had let's say more granular data and we could exploit this a little bit um, better, um, but this data is just not there. Okay, but I think that uh, I mean. Uh, I think that our, at least in terms of the cross section, our tests are gonna are gonna pick up this this variation uh, with some error, but I think that mm, not too inaccurately, I would say. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so I'll probably let others maybe ask questions, but if there's no questions, I'm happy to uh, carry on with uh, at least one of the point. If uh, but uh, I'll just keep my mouth shut now and let others maybe ask. Uh, Doctor Muhammad, can you hear me? Yes, you can ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Ormad. So, uh, how, how can we link the, um, the gain from uh, the sales of this allowance with the, uh, the earnings management practice and especially the smoothing? Can we, uh, can we consider the gain from sales as a smoothing income strategy? How can we link this uh, companies, yeah. the, this? this um, allowances so they they recognize again the so this gain is by definition uh, by definition is higher discretionary because there are no standards some companies use uh, uh, the historical cost some other use the fair value i think so how can we link the sales or the gain from sales with the income smoothing and especially real smoothing strategies thank you yeah all right so um let's see i guess i don't know i mean i I would probably need to think a little bit more about this, but I mean, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, this could be part of. I'm sure. I mean, if you if you define the earnings as moving as an intent to, um, to. Yeah, because this is, this is a real smoothing, I think, not not artificial. Okay, via yeah. the gain, the gain is largely discretionary, I think, because there are no standards. It is uh, it is subjective. It's more subjective, okay, because. Uh, 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 companies can report via um, historical cost or fair value. There are no standards, so I think it is um, higher discretionary. By consequence, uh, uh, firms can use this gain for income smoothing purposes. I mean, what I can uh, and say is that um, I mean, of course, this could be part of you know some sort of like earnings and smoothing strategy i mean you define earnings and smoothing as you know trying to reduce the volatility of earnings right um perhaps you know not in an informative way uh i mean this could be uh part of it when I mean, let me emphasize something i mean uh, what we are talking about here is i mean that it's a type of earnings uh, real earnings management uh, because they're not playing yes, with yes sure. They're not playing with accruals, right? So they are actually. I mean, this is this is an economic decision. This is a real transaction that is that is going on. Um, what I would say is that probably this is a particularly low cost uh, real earnings management strategy, to the extent that I mean the the, the traditional real earnings management strategies uh, they have to do with um, let's say real costs. I mean, like uh, whatever, cutting on advertisement and, uh, you know, things like that, right? Or R&D, right? And this, uh, you know, we know that these sort of things probably will come back to haunt you, so to speak, right? And in the in the future, you're going to pay uh, for the, the long-term consequences of these decisions, right? I mean, in this case, uh, like I showed in this last slide, it's not obvious that this is going to be bad for shareholders, so I mean, actually, you know, the cost of this could be internalized by someone else, another, a different stakeholder. Okay, so and to to this this um, this extent, I think that this is a relatively cheap real earnings management strategy. And in my mind, uh, I mean, if you made a ranking or like a, some sort of like pecking order of you know potential earnings and real earnings management strategy. Which are usually more costly than uh, accrual uh, uh, earnings management. Yeah. 
عزيز يا شور شور دكتور اند سبيشلي بيكوز سبيك اباوت ذا تايمينج ذا تايمينج اوف سيلز ذا تايمينج اوف سيلز اوكي يس تايمينج اوف ذا سيلز سو سيلز از اكزاكتلي وين لايك ذا بيبرز اوف بارتوف 1993 اي ثينك ذا تايمينج اوف سيلز اوف اسيتس يس ميك سموثينج يوزينج ذا تايمينج اوف سيلز Thank you so much for that. Yeah. In any case, uh, what I would add here is that, I mean, we are not claiming here that this is the only thing that they are doing, okay? So they could be uh, they could be using this earnings management strategy in combination with other types of earnings management strategy, okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you for your comment. Are there another questions? If you don't have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Like I said, like I said before, I do have uh, at least one other point. If uh, if I can do that, yes. Okay, go. all right. Thank you. Um, you know, when we look at um, uh, many multinational companies, um, let's say Euro European and uh, American, it is very well documented that they shift emissions to countries with lax regulations or with weak regulations. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering whether it is worth maybe doing a study on companies that have or claim to have excess um, allowances that they then uh, sell or trade to raise liquidity um, the reason why they claim to have excess allowances is because they are shifting the emissions to countries that are weak in terms of protecting themselves so the so the so the the selling of the excess is actually if you, you can describe it using some negative adjectives you can say this is just uh, you know they are lying in a way okay yeah. Um, the excess is not a real excess. It's just because they are they are shifting to other countries, okay? And that lead, leads me to a, a related point, whether because I'm I don't really know much about this, whether before a company can trade uh, its what what it may call the excess, do they need some sort of approval to make sure uh, that? the excess is excess and it's not needed for them to comply or reduce the, the emissions properly. Yeah. All right. So let's see if I can, uh, great points. Thank you. Um, let's see if I can uh, address them uh, satisfactorily. Um, let's say, yeah, I mean, perhaps one of the reasons why you have excess allowances is that you are shifting emissions outside. Uh, Basically, you know, this this um, carbon leakage. Um, that's that's a possibility. I mean, that would also let's say increase the sort of like the the the, the shadow of suspicion on 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 these firms that um, you know seem to be uh, having excess allowances. Um, we we, we I, I can. I, I can't say this for sure because we don't have any test on this. Okay, I mean we we don't we don't test anything on let's say shifting emissions or you know carbon leakage whether you know this is associated with carbon leakage. I mean I guess carbon leakage is something that is not trivial to measure. I mean I, I'm I know that there's some prior literature on that, um, but I mean it's, it's something that is a little bit beyond the scope of the paper. So I mean I, I can. I can make uh, make big statements on this, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna be very cautious, but I would um, sympathize with your concern that, uh, and yet this is another reason, you know, to basically for, I guess for regulators to um, basically take a cl closer look of these excess allowances and understand where they are uh, coming from. I mean, to be fair, I mean, it is possible that these excess allowances uh, come from basically the firm making a, an effort to decarbonize. And uh, um, and actually, um, I mean, you want to be 
provocative here, uh, when it comes to the, let's say, the welfare implications of what we are documenting, you could say that um, actually, you know, it, it might be, let's say, a positive side of this to the extent that, um, let's say that, you know, you, you it, it might generate incentives for you to decarbonize because let's say that you decarbonize, you end up with this, ex uh, if you decarbonize, you make a, a big effort on that side, you're going to end up with, a, with excess allowances, okay? Um, so there is paribus and, you know, with the status quo on, you know, even the, the current policy of, of, of granting allowances here. Then, I mean, if you have these excess allowances that you sort of like earn in quotes, right, uh, through your decarbonization efforts, then, and, you know, you have this flexibility to basically, you know, to fix your earnings here and there, or, you know, to get some liquidity advantage, right? Um, uh, and then, you know, to this, to, to this extent that, you know, the excess allowances are giving you this reporting and liquidity benefits, you would say, well, this is generating for you an incentive to actually have excess allowances through a channel that, you know, we would agree that uh, is actually has positive welfare implications because you are decarbonizing, right? So, again, I mean, I'm not ready to make a big statement here on, on you know, whether these excess allowances, what is, what is the origin of these excess allowances? What I can tell uh, tell you is that there have been that this is a concern for regulators. Regulators have been working really hard on this. Um, I mean, there is uh, there is a, there is a recent development um, in the in in Europe that there is there is some sort of like a central bank of this uh, of these allowances. Uh, precisely, you know, to so this this central bank. I mean, it's, it's called an, an a market adjustment mechanism. So basically, you know, this this mechanism, uh, which is automatic actually, uh, that is the policy. It actually regulates the the the, the supply uh, of uh, of allowances based on let's say the perceived uh, let's say amount of excess allowances on the market. Okay? And I can also tell tell you that let's say these free allowances are going to disappear in the future. I mean, they are meant to disappear by, if I'm not mistaken, by 2020, 2020. Eight, if I'm not mistaken, and you know, after the 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 CBAM, CBAM, for those of you that are not familiar, CBAM is um, uh, these are the it is the acronym for uh, cross border adjustment mechanism, and it's basically a tariff on carbon emissions of imports. Okay, so I mean, you're on a European firm, and uh, so you're gonna have to uh, pay a, a let's say a tariff based on the imports. Uh, the, the, let's say the, the carbon emissions are embedded or associated with your uh, imports, right? So this is, uh, again, meant to, uh, let's say, uh, generate a level playing field between, uh, let's say, Europeans and non-Europeans. Basically, what this is seeking is basically to, you know, to, to, to create a, a, a carbon price uh, in countries where there is no carbon price, okay? So... Uh, Part of this mechanism is that, uh, or you know, in conjunction with this mechanism, the the European Commission has introduced a policy to reduce these, um, uh, let's say, free emissions granted by governments uh, to firms. Okay. So um, I guess in the future, uh, to the extent that these free emissions are no longer there, and you know, having these free emissions is sort of part of is one of the institutional features that are sort of like generating this 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 arbitrage, you're gonna call it this way, this arbitrage opportunity that we are documenting. I think that you know this game that we are documenting here uh, is just gonna disappear in the in the future. Okay. With the, the the decrease of excess allowances and with the decrease of these these uh, emissions that are given for free. Okay. Uh, also, the process of giving these excess allowances has varied over time. I mean at the beginning it was a a, a top-down uh, sort of process where um, basically a, a countries were um, given the power uh, or the uh, let's say the, the 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 ability, you know, to give these allowances uh, to to the firms in in their country. Uh, now it's centralized, okay? and now it was based on uh, let's say past emissions of these firms. Uh, now it's, it's, it's based on benchmarks. It's no longer based on your prior emissions because, I mean, as you probably notice, I mean, this, I mean, if you get free allowances based on your past carbon emissions, it's not clear that this is generating an incentive for you to decarbonize, right? So my point here is that the process of 
giving these free allowances has changed. Uh, it's tighter than before. Uh, this the, the amount of free allowances that will be, let's say, given for free uh, is decreasing over time and it will, let's say, tend to zero in the in the future. Um, the, let's say we have this, this, this additional market mechanism that is actually controlling for the, 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 the aggregate supply of allowances in the system. So, uh, you know, we are in the process of, uh, let's say, reducing all these, these variables, right? All these, these parameters uh, that, uh, you know, you, you, you have seen there um, in, the, in the results, right? On the approval of the excess allowances, um, I think that you know I'm not aware of any any procedure uh, like the one that you described. Um, I think that you know the the excess allowances. I mean, I, I'm not sure you know to which extent um, there is a systematic control of these allowances at the firm level. I think that there is a, there is some sort of control at the at the economy level or at the at the system level, but not at the firm level that I know. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your questions again. Yeah, many, 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 many thanks for the detailed answers. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. Are there other questions? If you don't have any questions, uh, you can open your mic and ask you question. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, dear Professor uh, Rosabel, for your contribution and your effort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, for, uh, everyone joining us today. <clears throat> and thank you very much, uh, dear Professor Rosabel, for taking the time to present it to us uh, today. It's been really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and you. for giving me the, this opportunity. And, and I hope to see you soon in Egypt. You are very, very welcome. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Never been to Egypt. <laughs> you are very welcome. I've heard great things about it, but uh, I've never had a, an opportunity to go there. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>